Okay, it's three o'clock on Real Ale Craft Beer. I am joined by Rob Darbyshire of HopTeam.com. How are you doing, Rob? I'm all right, Simon. How are you? Not too bad, not too bad. Drinking a, a, a local beer from a local brewery in Britain. Yeah, well, mine's not that local. It's a brewery dog beer, but I do have a bottle of beer from my local brewery, Saltair Brewery, about a 15-minute walk from my house. 15-minute walk from your house. So you can yep. buy from the brewery in the local store. You can go and buy the beer very, very locally. And this brings us on to a, a topic which we're going to discuss. Uh, it's regarding System Bore. System Balagat. System Balagat. You can't now, say it, can you? <laughs> I can't say. I've tried. I've been, been practising. <laughs> System Balagat. Now, basically, what's happening is at the present moment, as of July 2014, System Balagat are selling a lot of Swedish craft beer. And you might be asking... Two UK bloggers, why are we talking about Swedish craft beer? Well, it's because we've drunk an awful lot of it, from Breckery to Oppergaz to, to Deuce to Knack, to, well, there's some great breweries from Jemted and Brand, there's, there's Imperial Stouts and all sorts of great beer from Swedish breweries. But, the Stembelage are a Swedish government alcohol monopoly where any beer over 3.5% ABV has to be sold through this government run chain of supermarkets if you like Rob. Yeah, yeah. so it's a funny old situation uh, and, and there is a lot of history that goes into this whole system to do with kind of um, limiting the kind of alcohol consumption in Sweden which is it's all kind of well and good. But I guess the point that we're coming, uh, we're addressing this from because um, we'll get onto the subject, and we we just want to talk about how it differs from the experience that we have in the UK. Yeah, I just turned my that horrible light that was on on me there. That's gone. Now, as from September, uh, to the horror of craft brewers in Sweden. Systembolage are changing the, the way they accept companies' beers. Now, if you're, I'm, I'm presuming you're aware of this, in Sweden, craft beer is booming. There's breweries opening all of the time. Mm -hmm. Our friend Beer Sweden, Darren, is opening his own brewery. Uh, I think it's called uh, Record, something, something Record Brewery, I believe. Um, great, great guy. He's, open, he's just about to open his brewery, and now he's got to face this law change. And this law change goes, it starts off with Breckery Brewery. Now, Breckery Brewery brew some fantastic beers. They're brilliant saison from, from the massive raspberry beer that's, that's, that's so sharp and crisp and lovely that, that everybody should try it, and, and certainly people in Sweden. Now... I'm going to try and cut a long story short here with this new rule. Um, Breckery, at the moment, they have 10 beers in 10 system lager stores around Sweden within a certain kilometre distance. Now, what, what I believe is happening here now is that they put their beers forward. Uh, they, they put three beers forward, tendered three solid products from their range. And uh, System Borage, System Lage, they, I'm struggling with the name. I think you know what I mean by now. Um, they've come back and they said, we'll only take one of the beers, not ten, but just one, in three stores in the, in the vicinity, in the area. But, the real kicker of this is that it's a it's a 300 kilometer trip to the warehouse where the beer needs to be delivered. Now, it's just not financially viable for this to happen. Rob, come in on this a little bit. Um, sorry, I'm leaving you. I'm just I'm just. No, no, no. I think we've got to Yeah, I know. Yeah, we've got to kind of lay out our kind of understanding of what it is. I mean, Simon's been talking to a, a Swedish friend who, uh, who was clearly con concerned about this, and I think rightfully so. I mean, this seems to be, I mean, 
you can get, draw comparisons to what happened in America, um, kind of like post prohibition with the free tier system, where you know, you're, you're limiting the uh, options on kind of like breweries being able to kind of um, succeed, really, because if um, you've only got one way of selling your beer, and they, and they won't, because of a, a government decision, you can't sell your product via the only kind of like um, your only option. Well, you you screwed, aren't you? I mean, um, existing breweries might start being kind of squeezed out a bit. New breweries haven't really got a chance, have they? I mean, if you if you're a new brewery, you can get only one of your beers on this kind of list when you start. If if one at all. Well, how yeah. do you how can you grow? I mean, and I think there's one thing um, that is the concern is it's all about uh, um, encouraging kind of um, indigenous growth, really. I mean, it's stunting, like stopping it happening. Yeah. Uh, potentially, and obviously we can't say this outright, um, appears to be in favour of established larger breweries. I mean, I'm not sure if the kind of like big big kind of like craft breweries in Sweden, I don't know if they're feeling the pinch as much, or is it more kind of um, focused towards the larger macro kind of um, producers, because I know that's exactly the issue in America, with the free tier system, if you're Budweiser, Miller cars, all that kind of business, you're in the pocket of the um, the government, I mean in the pocket of the, um, the distributors, then in turn are in the pocket of the senators, so it's all kind of like you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back, but at the detriment of the the indigenous kind of artisan producer. It seems to be where, where, where I'm standing here for a very small brewery like Brackery because okay they produce great beer but they, they're a small brewery compared to one of the or some of the larger breweries that operate in Sweden. It would be much easier for a larger brewery in Sweden to travel at 300 kilometers and okay if it's the same if, if it's just to deliver one beer most of these larger breweries only have one beer anyway that they <laughs> want to deliver yeah, yeah, yeah. so so it's easy for them they, they get their, their their shiny green cans or their shiny green bottles I can't believe it. I don't know who you mean. Who do you mean? Shiny green cans. There's not many large producers that produce green bars. Um, <laughs> only joking. No, 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 what we have here is something that stinks a little bit in my mind. The, you, you take small breweries to large breweries. Small breweries, small craft breweries in Sweden, they may have a range of, would you say, six to seven established kind of beers that they have on all of the time then they'll have a, uh, a season range a winter range a summer range well I guess and that's the kind of like craft beer model isn't it I mean it's, yeah. not, it's not about producing shed loads of one beer I mean I know, I know for the likes of Budweiser I mean there's not just Budweiser there's there's Bud Light and there's Bud Platinum and there's this and that and other but primarily, I mean, they're they're living, dying on that that core beer. I mean, that's that one. If they, if they didn't have to sell anything else, it wouldn't matter because that is their beer. That's what they're known for. But in craft beer, it's more about kind of diversity, the kind of experimentation of within kind of existing styles, moving beyond that. It's a creative uh, endeavor, really. It's not just about solely. I mean, it is a. I mean, it's business, but it's it's not solely about making the money, it's making an interesting kind of sometimes experimental kind of like product which some kind of sometimes speaks of your kind of like low, uh, local kind of area maybe it's taking the influence from a different country but it's it's not the interest I don't think as, an, as a craft beer drinker and a craft beer enthusiast, I don't, it just, to me it doesn't appear that is the goal of a craft brewer is to just make that one beer and make shed loads of it Seems like we, seems boring. We we've got a number, a, a a good number of people watching now. Hello in Sweden. <laughs> yes, we had we had, we had two UK bloggers. We are talking about your issues in Sweden. Um, thank you for sending the link out. I'm sure grab the link, send it to everybody, get them to watch this. But basically, where we were is that okay, Rob? Um, 
Rob went ahead and uh, mentioned a, a company. I'll go ahead and make an example. Say, say for argument, say Carlsberg, the lager, they want it in, in the system. System, system lager. The stem lager stores. <laughs> uh, excuse me for my bad pronunciation of this. They want it in their stores. They can travel that 300 kilometers to deliver that one beer because they can. They can get away with it because they only have, generally, one or two beers in their range. So for the larger brewery, just just this kind of cut-off which seems to have come in where you're going to have one beer on the shelf of this government-run company, that's fine. But what me and Rob were just talking about now, somebody like Breckery, Oppergall, Douche, Knack, Omnipolo, they, they've got a big, vast range of beer, and they alternate from summer to winter. It's not possible for them, and it's not logistically possible, to travel 300 kilometres one way to deliver one beer. Yeah, it's um, well, it's the infrastructure, isn't it, of, the, of a company. I mean... I, um, if, for example, uh, uh, Brecker, uh, uh, I mean, it might be a two-man band. It's a matter of one of these two people. There's probably more than this. I mean, from all, all accounts, from what we've had a look into, uh, Brecker, uh, kind of like a 20-barrel brewery. I mean, as, as far as kind of English standards go, that's a, yeah, I mean, it's quite a standard regional local brewery, something like that. It's not tiny, but it's not massive by any stretch of the imagination. Very much the size of a craft brewery. If that's a two-man band, maybe five people involved, I don't know, if, but if, same, say, for example, they are, one of these guys has to get in a van, drive it to, I think it's the most, the local store, the, the most local sustainable lager, and then it's picked up from there. I think that's how it works. But if you're a bigger brewery, of numerous size, you might be multinational, whatever. You've got a system, you've got infrastructure, you've got you've got trucks and vans and stuff. You can send that big lorry over with shed loads of it. Even if you're only allowed one, that one product in, you're going to send a load of it over. Yeah. Because that's your business model, which is unfortunate. I mean, for example, when when we you were talking about this, it got me thinking. When when Colonel Brewery in uh, in London when they first started up, I mean, started maybe doing like eight barrels, something like that. Um, when they wanted to sell their beer to um, a shop somewhere else in London, not a million miles away, maybe like ten miles away, kind of modern, um, north London, that beer, those boxes of beer were sent from Colonel Brewery to Chris's Wines in um, kind of Camden Town area in the back of a taxi. I mean, because the, I mean, it's a small business, that they don't have the infrastructure to do that. But if you're a big business, you've you got the infrastructure. It's convenient. It's not It's not an issue. But for a small brewery, and if with these restrictions, it clearly would be an issue. It's, it's, it's exactly, and it's exactly that point. You've got a local brewery. Talk about your local brewery. You've got Salt Air Brewery, which is a mile away from you. But, but even more to the point, is that you've got a store even closer to you that sells salted beers. Yeah, I mean, um, as far as we're concerned, I mean, salted brewery, I can walk there in 15 minutes. I can buy uh, I can buy the bottles out from the brewery if I want, but then I can go to End Street. And, and there's a little corner shop, independent-owned corner shop, and I can go there and buy a beer from Salted Brewery, which has probably gone up in the back of the Draymond's van, He's been taking casks of ale to local pubs, and he'll go to that shop and drop off a couple of cases. It's that simple. Yeah. I mean, we do. I mean, in that sense, we're very privileged, even in comparison to like America, which is the, probably the biggest craft beer kind of like um, drinking place in the entire world. But so you I mean it, it seems quite um, it seems pretty crazy to us that this is happening. For example, we were saying earlier, probably the biggest supermarket chain in the UK is, is Tesco's. Um, Tesco's, for example, if Tesco's was government owned, it's not. But there's multiple Tesco's in most towns. If that was the only pe place you could drink beer, I find it frightening, the selection that would be eventually available. You mean, all these local breweries that we get to enjoy, 
I mean, even breweries from further afield, the tiny little breweries that we can go online and buy, or you can go to a local shop if you're there on holiday, you can go and buy those beers. It, it, I do find it frightening that how the, the, the size and the, the restriction of, of selection that we'd have if that was the case. I mean, can you imagine if it were all Marston's and, yeah. and, and all the bigger breweries doing boring it's stuff? It stops. Just being able to buy there. John Smith's, just being able to buy Carlsberg, Heineken. Um, I think I, I, I think I'd turn to another drink. I think I'd turn to another alcoholic beverage entirely if I was down to buy that kind of beer. Now, um, so so moving on, Breckery have now said that in from September onwards, when when Sistembalaga introduced this new rule, it will be easier to buy their beer in New York City in America, thousands of miles away than it would be their local town, which is a mile away. Amazing, Rob. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? Amazing. Mm. Now, but, um, we, before we were on air, you, you were talking a little bit about America. Mm. America has has similar rules, but it's slightly different. Talk a little bit about the American scene and how they sell their beer. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying I'm an expert on this. I've worked, I've read multiple things and watched a number of documentaries about it. But uh, obviously, with the three tier system, which is all uh, um, kind of hangover from prohibition, still a very restrictive system. You know, what I mean, it's essentially you go through a middleman. If you want to sell, if your brewery, a, you want to sell it to that pub in the next state, you've got to go through a middleman. The middleman is an independent business. It, uh, obviously, if, if you're a bigger brewery, for example, uh, uh, AB InBev, you've got you've got a lot more money. You can throw that money at this distributor, make a lot more of an attractive proposition to um, take most of the uh, more of their beer than it is a small brewery who don't have the luxuries of being able to kind of like uh, grease your palm, shall we say, and make mm. it a better idea. I mean, it's, it's a business decision. But it's stunting growth. I mean, if, if if you can't get your, if you're, for example, Dogfish Head, based in um, uh, Milton, Delaware, if you uh, want to sell your beer in New York City, and you can't get a distributor to distribute your beer to New York, it will not go there. You've got to find some other way of selling your beer, and that's why a lot of American breweries um, have uh, have brew pubs and taps at their brewery because. Potentially can't sell it out of state. I mean, so many look at Free Floyds. I think they distribute to eight states in the U.S. because they've got to go through this system. They can't. You can't go on Free Floyds website and buy kind of bottles of zombie dust. You just because of this law. One great thing that I happen, uh, what I heard about, is um, Stone Brewery. They um, set up uh, their own distribution in, in order to help their friends who were working and running craft breweries. In, in San Diego and kind of like in Southern California, and that's how that kind of like that West Coast beer scene kind of grew, because Stone took away that the urgence to use that middleman. They were now the middleman. They're on our side, so therefore, I mean, you you you're halfway there. I mean, because you don't have to go through all that nonsense because yeah. you've got somebody on your side as it is, which is great. I mean, and th that's how it's exploded over there. So that's how Stone have, have, have kind of grown to the size they are. Now, yeah. the next question I've got and the next subject I want to talk about is is why don't uh, – there's a few European countries. I think Norway and Denmark have this same – and Finland certainly do. I know Finland has this same um, law in place where it's all kind of government run. Who gets to buy, what type of alcohol, where – and I, I'm, I'm – Excuse me if I'm wrong, um, I got this from Wikipedia, but I read on Wikipedia that the Sweden is part of the vodka belt, where a lot of people uh, drink vodka in the wintertime, and it got a little bit out of control, there was a lot of binge drinking, the government got involved, they brought out this this system, if you like, mm. this, this store of... this chain of stores where you're only allowed to sell alcohol, okay, 
it makes sense. It does make a little bit of sense. But on the other hand, we're in a different situation with craft beer now. It's a worldwide phenomenon. It's catching on all over the world, from, from Italy to, to Belgium to the UK to America to Poland, whatever country you mention regarding beer, craft beer is the, is the talk about subject. Now, why is it then, Rob, that, that Swedish breweries uh, and uh, Swedish people are not allowed to be responsible in the, in the way that they, they buy their alcoholic drinks and certainly craft beer yeah well it's a, it's a funny old situation I mean and just from a cursory glance at very the subject I think it goes back to like 1830 or something does this whole situation but and but the same thing applies to you mean America and, um, and prohibition that was well, where was that the 40s or something like that 40s, yeah, 1920s maybe, yeah. Yeah, it goes back, it's a, it's a it's hangover from, excuse the pun, um, from a, a, a time gone by. I mean, you, 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 in, you're placing kind of restrictions on a society, which is now based on rules that were agreed a long time ago. Sometimes it doesn't kind of know that society changes, so therefore is it even kind of that relevant anymore? I mean, so we, we also in the UK have issues with um, kind of alcoholism and things like that. Like a lot of places, we we are from a we are in very much a social drinking culture, and there's lots of restrictions that are on breweries to do with if you brew a beer which is over seven percent, you have to pay a lot more money. That's risk, that's kind of hurting kind of create uh, creativity within craft beer in the UK. Yeah. But that that law is brought in to stop people. Going out buying cheap bottles of wine and stuff and doing themselves harm. Yeah. This is one thing that Brewdog have really kind of campaigned against because, I mean, craft beer is not about getting pints and pints of it down your neck in large volume and large quantities. Mm. More about the appreciation of um, the beer. I mean, if you look at um, Copenhagen beer celebration, for example, the glass that you get there is absolutely tiny. I mean. It, it, and, and uh, Indie Man Beer Con, which is probably the big kind of craft brewery uh, kind of um, festival in the UK, you, you only get a third glass there. It's about tasting. It's not about boozing. It's, it's exactly what Rob is saying. He's touched the nail on the head with a hammer. Is that Rob? I've sent. I've sent Rob. We met at the Great British Beer, beer Festival. A couple of years ago, I took him some Mohawk beers, some IPAs, and um, really enjoyed them. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a case of it's a case of crack a beer open, a good beer. Now Sweden produces some great, great beers. They're, I'm a massive fan of their Imperial Stouts, massive fan of their IPAs. Generally, a massive fan of, of, of a lot of things Sweden do does in beer. Now. As Rob said, with craft beer, it's not about volume. It's not about sitting on some park bench <laughs> with a brown paper bag over your craft beer, necking eight to ten craft beers to get yourself stupidly drunk. It's about sitting there. I like to, to, to look at my glass of beer. I, I like to, to, to see if it's bright or if it's cloudy or what Rob's doing now. We get the aroma. We like to see if there's lacing on the glass, and and of course we like to taste really good beer. Unfortunately, on a government point of view, craft beer is a little bit stronger than regular beer, and it and it might be that they've fallen on this side of the fence that oh we're not going to try it, we're not going to try and drink this beer, we're not going to taste it, but we're going to have our say. We're going to say that it's that is 7% or is 8% ABV, and that it shouldn't be sold or it should be sent through this system lag, it should be sent through this shop. And what they're campaigning for, what I'm trying to say here, is that they're campaigning for their beer to be sold in local stores. Yeah, I mean, well, that's how it should be, really. I mean, there's no reason why it shouldn't. I mean, if, if you go around the UK, um, go to any kind of... Kind of farm shop in go down to Norwich or something somewhere in Suffolk wherever you go in that shop you'll be able to buy some locally reared beef 
some lovely sausages, some nice locally produced cheese, and there'll be a, there'll be a couple of shelves of locally produced beer. Bingo. So why not? I mean, I, I kind of understand the reason why this kind of happened in the past, but it's it's restricting it was restricting kind of growth of local and kind of indigenous businesses um, for I can't see what good anymore. I mean, really, I mean, and um, one thing I was thinking about was um, if you are restricted, say if you're if you're uh, Opigard or something like that, you can only sell one beer. Which beer do you brew? Mm. And the and and because if that's what your brewery kind of like lives and dies on. You'll go for the one that people will drink the most of, and still it's probably lager. So, so do all these fantastic breweries doing these incredible beers? Do they start kind of boiling down to the lowest common denominator, and then that kills off all experimentation, all breadth of style, all kind of like choice. Us kind of craft beer enthusiasts enjoy because that's what it is. I mean. Such such an incredible breadth of kind of beer styles that we get to enjoy, which is great. And this is why we have this interest and this passion for this kind of um, this, this the thing in the glass, um, because we can experience so much. And it's relatively um, affordable as well, which is a great thing about beer. Craft beer obviously is a little bit more expensive, but it's a lot cheaper than buying whiskey and wine and stuff like that. Yeah. So it's something that a lot of people can can enjoy. But when that becomes an issue, you can only have that one beer, you, it starts making your choices smaller and smaller and smaller. I think just as a human, that's really that's really disappointing. I mean, if you could only eat kind of one type of cheese, like for the rest of your life, how depressing is that? It, it's depressing, but the next topic I want to move on to, and this is probably a little bit more stressful, <laughs> is that we know Rob from from breweries in the UK and travelling around that people literally put their lives on the line. They remortgage the ha- their, yeah. their houses. They take out big bank loans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They they put they work thirteen, fourteen hour days, mm-hmm. and to then open a brewery. And find out that this new law has been put in place. It's it's a so, it's a sorry tale. It's a sorry yeah. tale. Yeah, I mean, if you if you I mean if that was your kind of like dream, and you're seeing this kind of like Swedish craft beer culture growing, because it is. It's, I mean, it's, it's it is one of the biggest growing craft beer scenes in the world. I mean, if you go and look at the the main people who are kind of rating on rate beer, a big handful of them are Swedish. I mean. And 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 there are multiple kind of UK brewers, some of the best brewers in the UK. They they want to be part of that market. They want their beer available in Sweden because they know it's a place where things are happening. So I mean, if you see this thing growing, and you want to be a part of it, I mean, if you've got an interest and a passion about this, you want to be a part of it. And then you've got it. You've got your place up and running six months later. You're just about finding your feet, and then this happens. I mean, how how crushing could that be? And it could be, as you said, it could be very, it it could be quite destructive in a lot of people's lives, and which is a, I mean, it's a terrible thing, terrible thing. Hmm. Absolutely. Um. Probably the last subject we'll touch on, um, is obviously the um, a little bit of the probably conspiracy this 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 there <laughs> in the in the it's probably to do with uh, big breweries, and it's probably to do with tax, and it's probably to do with a little bit of this, a little bit of backhand that's going on. Unfortunately, the Breckeries, the Opera Gars, the Dews, the Nax, the Omnipolos, they have not got that kind. Not that they would, because they're probably decent people. They, they haven't got that kind of money um, ha- as the, the, the Carlsbergs, the Heinekens, to be able to force through this rule. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, exactly. It's uh, it's the small business suffers at the hands of, of, of big corporations. I mean, it's not the first time it's ever happened. It's the last time it will ever happen, but it's a really, it's a real unfortunate situation, especially, as I said, with such a kind of like a, a booming kind of 
segment of uh, of kind of Swedish business, really, in a sense. And it's, it's, it's a good thing. For me, and this is why I enjoy craft beer and real ale and whatever you want to call it. That's why I enjoy it. It's, 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 it's a local thing. It's, a, it's an inclusive thing. It's an exciting thing, and we can all be involved in it. But when big business kind of starts kind of looming over and kind of putting the pressure on and elbowing people out of the way, I mean, I think we all lose out in the end. Apart from that. And it shows that, in a way, we're, we're tramping. The, the craft beer scene is growing. I read an article the other day regarding Miller Coors in America. Um, they've admitted, Miller Coors, that they've, their eye wasn't on the ball. They wasn't watching what was going on. And now they're going to pull resources from other areas and they're going to put something like 25% of their whole division into craft beer. Yeah. It's, it's just shows that there's a market for it. The people are going nuts for it. As I said, in America, from the UK to everywhere else, um, it's a growing thing. Um, but just to, before we go, I'm just going to quickly touch over because we still got we're growing the viewership all of the time. I just want to touch on where we are. Why I entitled this video. I titled this video "System Lagging Killing Craft Beer in Sweden" is because. Uh, there's been a lot of uproar in Sweden at the moment. There's a lot of newspaper articles, a lot of TV coverage on this. Is that a company called Breckery Brewery? Uh, at the moment, they sell 10 beers in their country. From September onwards, they will only be able to sell one of their beers in in the whole of the Swedish craft beer government-run system. Which, well, it's financially unviable for a start. Uh, they put three beers forward for this new system. Only one come back from system lagging, saying that it was okay and they'll take it. But they must take it first on a 300 kilometer trip to the, to the warehouse. Now, we all know that that is not financially viable. There's a lot of concern in the Swedish craft beer industry regarding, unfortunately, I've got to say the word, there's a lot of people wondering if they're going to go bankrupt. There's a lot of people who put their lives on the line with all of this. Um, and and just when craft beer is, is getting going, just when it's booming. Um, mm. So that's the concern, really. Um, Rob, thank you very much for joining me on this on this subject. Do you have anything else to, to touch on before before we go? Well, I was going to say, I mean, everybody who's watching, if you're saying people keep joining us, please give us more information. Leave comments in the, in the comments section on Simon's channel. Tell us what your opinion is. Tell us your side of the story. Because, I mean, we're, we're kind of we're craft beer enthusiasts. We know what we love. We, we kind of only know bits and bits about this. But we want to share kind of our kind of like concerns. If it was happening to us, it would be, be an alarming time. Leave your comments. Get involved in the kind of in the conversation. We want to know what you think. Tell us what you think. Tell us what you know, because I think this is a, a subject that, if this is going to happen in Sweden, it could happen anywhere. Yeah, it could happen anywhere. Now, um, okay. Final thought is that, as we can buy our local beers in our local stores in the UK, Rob can buy his Saltair in his little town of Saltair, his Saltair Brewery beers. I can buy my Vale of Glamorgan beers half a mile away in my local shop. I have that opportunity. Sweden, I hope you get your opportunity. I hope you win with this battle. I hope you kind of you you get this revolution going and you can go down to your local farm shop or store or wherever it is you want to buy your beer and you buy your beer. You get the chance to do it. Thanks, Rob, for joining me. Uh, Cheers. Great guest as always. Um, check him out, Rob, at .com or, or just Google Hopscene in the YouTube bar. Maybe even YouTube Hopscene in the YouTube bar. Um, thanks for watching. Put your comments in the comments box. Subscribe to our daily beer reviews and cheers. Cheers.